CJ the Rabbit. I've been visiting Gaia Road for over 30 years. I love to do that because you do things that make me feel good about my name. Celebrate Jesus. Get it? CJ the Rabbit. I am so excited that Easter is almost here. That's when we celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To prepare, Miss Gina has made a picture of me, CJ. It is somewhere in our church. If you find it, let Miss Gina know and we'll announce your name next week.
visiting Gaia Road for over 30 years. I love to do that because you do things that make me feel good about my name. Celebrate Jesus. Get it? CJ the Rabbit. I am so excited that Easter is almost here. That's when we celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To prepare, Miss Gina has made a picture of me, CJ. It is somewhere in our church. If you find it, let Miss Gina know and we'll announce your name next week.
Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Good morning, everybody. With that reminder that uh, we are standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before us and we are wanting to leave a legacy for those who come behind us to be faithful, to point the way to Jesus. We're glad you're here today. We're glad you're here to, to worship and we, we welcome you, those here in person, also those connecting online. We do hope and pray that you would experience a little bit more of the presence of the Lord Jesus today and uh, savor his love as we worship him today. Let's now tune our hearts to sing his praise and yield to him. Good morning, everyone. Please rise and sing our call to worship. Here we go. I love thee, I love thee, I love thee, my Lord. I love thee, my Savior. I love thee, my God. I love thee, I love thee, and thou Snow, but how much I love thee, my actions will show. Oh, who's like my Savior? He Salem's bright king. He smiles and he loves me and helps me to sing. I'll praise him, I'll praise him with notes loud and clear. While rivers of pleasure my spirit shall cheer. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King. Sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I praise you, Lord, and I lift my voice to honor you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy. Good morning, Guy Road. It's a beautiful day out. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your time and your presence with us today. Be with us and think about what Jesus did on Palm Sunday as he rode in on that colt where people were throwing down palm leaves and screaming on Hosanna. And all the while he knew that he would have to face the trials and the ridicule and the pain of what he went through and the death he took upon the cross for our sins. Let us all just be mindful that when we listen to Brother's Ed message today, we put it in our hearts so we know be what best to do for our lives and for the lives of our families and for the people that we know that don't know you and how we can bring them to know you. We just thank all these things in your name. Amen. Scripture reading today is from John 5, verses 21 through 24. Would you read with me, please? For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all the judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. 
who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has the eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Thank you. To Jesus by the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In the blood, in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you gone spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing this my plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. Here we go. The strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. 
Our God is an everlasting God, and yet there are still people that do not know the full nature of how everlasting God is and how good he is. This, this season of the year, Easter season, we, we emphasize the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We're a little over halfway towards our goal. But just to remember, if, if you would like to, to pray and give for uh, North American missions, we encourage you to do so. Mark Copeland is going to read our missions moment in a little bit different way of, of looking at missions. So. Now we're good. All right. Could you bring that picture up for me, Bill? Thanks. I figured rather than speak of all these words on these pieces of paper, and the pictures on the paper, and you can get this out the foyer, I thought I'd share the photograph. Um, and pr I'll, I'll, I'll say right now the names I have are pretty difficult, so. I'll do my best. Alehu and Vigeli Dubali are originally from Ethiopia. So when you think about missions, we think about we going over to them. You know, we're going to Africa. We're going to South America. They came from Ethiopia in 2015. Um, when he was over in Ethiopia, he was saying in his little brochure that it was so easy to go to village to village because the people who lived in those villages would congregate and he could spread the gospel really easily. What he found in Denver, Colorado, was all these Ethiopians, 50,000 of them, had multiple jobs, three jobs sometimes, to make ends meet. And they didn't have a congregate area where they would meet collectively. So he had to go to individual homes, individual places, to, to meet with these people because, according to him, a lot of these folks from Ethiopia who live in Denver now still haven't heard the, the word of Jesus Christ. And I'll, quote, I'll do a little quote from him. In Africa, I was traveling village to village planting churches, but when I arrived here in the United States, I saw these Ethiopian people who had never heard about Jesus, not even once. I knew I had to do everything, every opportunity to draw people to living here in Christ. And then later on he says, in Africa you can gather people anywhere, anytime, but here you have to search for them because they're so busy. They have many jobs they have to be uh, working towards to make ends meet. And we're now planning the gospel here with the Ethiopian church with believers here in Denver. So it's amazing to think that this man came over to the United States and thinking we have, we're the land of plenty, yet we were still lacking in the ability to follow Jesus Christ with his own people. So it's quite, really cool that he's doing that in Denver. And as a side note, when we had a mission trip out there with Mission Serve, we served in Boulder, Colorado, just east of Denver. It's amazing to see the impact we had with just the simple jobs we did on a simple mission here in the United States. So be praying for encounters that will turn into witness opportunities for all of us, not just the people who are out in the fields. Um, be have a more st stable building for a church for the DeBells so they can meet the ministry needs of Denver, Colorado. And God to grow not just his life and his family's life, but into all our lives so we can launch the hearts of Jesus in all of us. Thank you.
As we continue to pray for God to speak to us, Jeff will continue to lead us in his worship. And let's, let's just be a time to pray not only for people that need to know Jesus, but that we might know him better. At this point, if our younger children would like to be dismissed to a children's church, or it looks like some of them have already come out, uh, Scott Shook is, is doing that today. So anyway, um, let's do go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you did seal our pardon upon the cross when you died and shed your blood for our sin. And Lord, we thank you that you set us free that day. As we remember back to that very first Palm Sunday and how the crowds were rejoicing that day and hailing you with hosannas and proclaiming you the Messiah. And yet people on that day just didn't understand the full ramifications of what it meant that you were Messiah. And Lord, we confess we still don't fully grasp all of who you are. Lord, we still misunderstand. We still get confused. Lord, open our eyes. Open our hearts. Open our ears and minds to to hear the word you would reveal to us this day. May your Holy Spirit teach us and reveal more of you to us this day. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Martin Winslow says he remembers that day very vividly. He was working in the barn in a small farm near West Plains, Missouri, when he got a phone call on the cell phone from his mother, and his his stepdad had been involved in a traffic accident. And his mom said, "I, I don't know how bad it is, but it looks pretty serious, and the ambulance has transported your dad to the hospital. And Martin, as he wrote the story, said, so after I hung up with my mom, I... Went back and worked in the barn until my mom or my wife called me for dinner. And then uh, we had a quick b- prayer for my stepdad and enjoyed a, a delicious spaghetti dinner. He says, no, that's not what happened at all. And as soon as I hung up with my mom, I immediately jumped in my truck and was praying all the way, rushing to the hospital. And, and luckily when I got there, my stepdad had some broken bones and a punctured lung, but turned out nothing too life-threatening. And he, he recovered. And, and so I'm grateful for that. But Martin Winslow wrote the story that way because 
when we hear the way he ended the story the first time, that just seems wrong. After hearing news like that, that he'd, he'd go back and work and, and, and not be concerned to, to go check on his friend. And yet, that's exactly the way our story today begins. Jesus has received the word that his good friend Lazarus is, is seriously ill. And yet Jesus doesn't drop everything and rush urgently off to his side, but he, he lingers and he stays. And, and you hear that story and it just seems that's not the way you'd normally react. What, what was up with that? Well, Jesus did have a purpose. And so let's look in, in John chapter 11 to remind ourselves what the full story was that day. John chapter 11, starting in verse 1, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus was, now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. If when he walks by, it is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to, to uh, comfort them in their loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. 
When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let's consider the different aspects of this story as we continue into this last of the, the six resuscitations that happened before the resurrection of Jesus. We, we see, sir, first of all, the confusion. There are certain elements from this story that are, that are confusing both in Jesus' statements and in the misunderstanding of the, of the disciples. First of all, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. And yet, Lazarus died. Was Jesus wrong? No. Did, did, did he knew the truth? Did he, did he misspeak? No. It's that in Jesus' perspective, the death of Lazarus was not the end of the story. He said the story won't end in death. He went on to say uh, in, in verse 4, it is for God's glory that this happened. Now, at face value, that seems a little harsh. It's for God's glory that Lazarus died. This, this friend of yours, this man that you, you loved you, and, and you loved his, his sisters, his family, doesn't that seem a little harsh to say it's for God's glory? Yet, remember just a, a couple chapters earlier in John chapter 9 when Jesus and the disciples came and accosted a man who was, who was blind from birth and the disciples asked the question, well, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And, and Jesus said, it's neither of those, but it's for God's glory glory that has happened that the works of God should be displayed in his life. And that's the point Jesus is making here. He said it is God's works are about to be displayed in Lazarus' life. It is for God's glory that has happened. This sometimes God works together to bring tragedies into testimonies of his provision and his glory. In 1967, a 17-year-old teenager by the name of Johnny Erickson dove into a lake and, and had uh, not understood how shallow the water was and struck her head, broke her neck, left her paralyzed from the, week, from the, the neck down. And this, this vibrant, healthy, athletic teenager was, was left to sit in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. And, and yet, even in that situation, God could work together in good. Romans 8, 28 says, God works together in all things for the good of those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't mean that, that everything that happens is good. God takes even the bad situations and he works together to bring good out of it. And, and you've probably heard of Johnny Erickson because she, she became a strong woman of faith and wrote multiple books and, and had many speaking engagements. She's been on stage with Billy Graham. She's been able to, to share the gospel with countless people. And, and now in her 70s, she's still a, a vibrant testimony to the glory of God because even in, in, a, in a heartbreaking situation, God work together to bring a glorious result. God is going to be glorified in this situation as well. Now, the Bible says that Jesus stayed where he was for two more days. And we read that and think that, that just seems strange. Was, was Jesus indifferent to the urgency of the situation? Was he, was he uncaring in that situation? And yet, sometimes in our prayer life, when God doesn't answer a prayer with the urgency of the timing that we think it ought to have, do we sometimes question, oh, wait a minute, does, does God not care? Does he not understand how important this is? The reality is, yes, God cares. It's just his timing is often different from our timing. After these two days, he told his disciples, okay, we're going to go back to Judea. We're going to go back to, to Bethany. And, and he tells them that Lazarus has fallen asleep. Now, the disciples misunderstand. And, and so Jesus had to clarify. And you remember last week when we looked at, at the story of the, the raising of Jairus' daughter. And, and Jesus said the same thing. She, she's, she's not dead. She's only asleep. Uh, it, and you remember last week, the, the mourners that 
at Jairus' house, they, they, they laughed at Jesus. They scoffed at him with a condescending attitude that says, Who do you, what do you think you know? We know better than you, you do. We know she's really dead. Well, the reality is Jesus knows all things. And he knew the reality of this situation as well. Now, he, he, he did clarify to the disciples that, that, that Lazarus has died. Now, if you calculate the days, Jesus stayed where he was two days. A, a messenger had come. Probably Jesus was about 15 or 20 miles away from Bethany. So it would have taken a day's journey to have a messenger come and tell Jesus because in those days, cell service wasn't very good. Okay. Uh, and, and so it took a day for the message to get there. He stayed there two more days, a day back, but that accounts for the, the four days. But, but Jesus clarified to say he is dead. And yet he, he goes on to say something very interesting. He says, for your sake, I am glad. And that seems very strange. Wow. For, for the disciples sake, you're glad you weren't there when maybe you could have done something for Lazarus. And, and it seems a little harsh, but then read what Jesus says. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. You See, that's the bigger issue from Jesus' perspective. He wants them to see God work in such a way that they would believe. The reality is sometimes God allows things to happen in our life that are difficult, that are, that are heartaches, that are struggles, but sometimes God allows some of those things so that we can, can have our illusion of self-sufficiency shattered because we realize then how much we need him. From Jesus' perspective, his, his idea wasn't that, that, that everything should be hunky-dory for Lazarus and Mary and Martha. His, his greater desire was he wanted God to get glorified in such a way that many people would understand that, that the Father had sent Jesus and he wanted them to believe. Sometimes people think, oh, God would want me to be happy. Do you know, in Scripture, the Bible never says God's ultimate desire is for you to be happy. His ultimate desire is for you to be holy. He orchestrates things in such a way that, that we see our need for God and recognize our absolute dependence upon Him. And apart from some of those struggles, we, we all just go along our merry way and think, oh, I can handle this. How often we misunderstand. And the disciples misunderstood. They misunderstood the risk. When he said, well, we're going to go back to Judea. And, and right before this time, Jesus had been teaching. And the Pharisees were, were angry because they thought, oh, Jesus is calling himself God. And they're ready to stone him. And, and so when they said, we're going to go back there. And, and the disciples thought, well, Jesus, that's pretty risky. <laughs> As if Jesus didn't know what the risk were. And, and so he said, look, Lazarus is dead. And, and it's interesting that, that when he says we're going to go now to him, to him, to Lazarus, the disciples were thinking, wait a minute, we're going to go to Lazarus? He's dead. How, how are we going to go be with him? And so Thomas, of all people, speaks up and said, well, let's go with him. We'll just die right alongside with him. Now, Interesting, Thomas, you remember, was the disciple that after Jesus' resurrection, he says, oh, look, I'm not going to believe until I can, I can place my fingers in the nail prints and thrust my hand inside. I, I'm not going to believe it. I, maybe Thomas was a pessimist by nature, but maybe it's a little bit of false bravado here. Say, well, he's going to die. Let's all die with him. The reality is when the disciples did go to Jerusalem, they, they all ran away and fled and deserted Jesus. Disciples, <laughs> again and again in Scripture, we, we read how they, they, they didn't get it. They didn't understand. They got confused by different things Jesus said, and, and they didn't fully grasp who he was. And, and we have a tendency to look back at them and, and kind of look in judgment and say, boy, those dumb disciples, you know, they just didn't get it. They got confused. They, you know, we, we do have the advantage now of, of understanding more of fully who Jesus was, and we have the advantage of the Holy Spirit giving us to, to help teach us. But don't we sometimes still get confused? Don't we still misunderstand what God is doing sometimes? 
it just reminds me that we need to press that much more closely to Jesus in, in prayer and studying his word and, and asking his spirit to enlighten us to, so that we can have more of Jesus revealed to us. Yes, they had confusion. And yes, we still deal with confusion. The second part of the story deals with the conviction. When Jesus arrived on the scene, he didn't quite get all the way to the house yet, and, and, and Martha heard that Jesus was coming, and, and Martha, she was the practical one that always wanted to do something. You remember the story in Luke chapter 10 when, when Jesus was coming to Mary and Martha's home and, and, and Martha was being the good hostess and she was cooking the meal and taking care of everything and, and, and Mary was just sitting at Jesus' feet listening and, and she was the one that says, oh, we got to do something. We got to keep busy. We got to provide. And, and that's, that's just Martha's personality. So Mary stayed where she was, but Martha came running out to Jesus and, 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 and basically she, she, she's playing the what if game, the first words out of her mouth, well, well, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Do you hear the heartache, the hurt in her voice? Je Jesus, we, we called for you four days ago. Why didn't you come then? But she, she was playing that what if game, what if this had happened or what if that had happened differently or, or, or what if, but but she says in verse 22, but I know that even now God will give you what you ask of him. Even now we can do something. Isn't that the temptation we have to, to, to want to do something, to do the fixing? Yet ultimately, Martha knew the right place to go. Because who can fix this but Jesus himself? Martha wanted to do something. And so she said, when, when Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again, Martha answered, I, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha had that kind of preconceived notion that sometimes can hinder us from hearing what God is saying to us. She, she had that mindset when, when she says, your brother will rise again. She thinks, well, oh, I know at the end time there will be a resurrection. I know someday death will be no more. And, and, you know, Scripture gives us illustrations of that in 1 Corinthians 15 and the 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And, and, and we have that future promise. But Jesus had in mind something more immediate. <laughs> he says, look, your brother's going to rise again. You're not going to have to wait till the end of the time. It, it, it's going to happen today. He, he didn't say that specifically, but he did say, I am the resurrection. You don't have to wait for that. So Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. But then Jesus asked for her personal belief. Point blank. She said, he says, do you believe that? He doesn't say this is a theoretical, this is a hypothetical statement. He doesn't ask, what do other people think? I, I think he looked Martha right in the eye and says, do you believe this? And Martha was able to answer in the affirmative, yes, Lord. I, I believe you're a Messiah. I believe you're the one to come. I believe you are the resurrection of life. She, she was able to answer in the affirmative. Guess what? You will have that chance someday as well. Because 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, Each one of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And you too will be asked, Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Martha was able to answer in the affirmative. Martha was able to, to affirm. And so... so Martha then ran to go get her sister. And it's interesting that when, when Mary came and reached the place where Jesus was, she, the Bible says she, she fell at her feet, at his feet, and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Does that sound familiar? It is the exact same words. Mary's words echo Martha's words. Coincidence? Think about it. For Four days, they had been mourning and grieving. Four days, they were probably 
wondered, why do you think Jesus didn't come? Four days they were, they were commiserating together. Four days they were sharing this grief and, and, and probably talking back and forth. And, and, and maybe their, their echoing of the words got back to, to the fact that they had a shared hurt that, that made them, you know, come to the same conclusion. Lord, if you had been here, Lord, you could have done something. Lord, why didn't you come faster? And before they, they, they found agreement in their hurt. What's the application? In this day and age, there are groups, including because of the internet, people tend to seek out people that think like they do who talk like they do, who assume the same things they do. And, and sometimes there, there's such a connection, a bond that is formed there, either for good or for bad, that, that that's all they can think of is, is, is they want that shared mentality of people that think just like they do. But think what Mary and Martha both would have missed out on if they hadn't seen there's a bigger picture. There's another way of thinking. There's a different ending to this story. Now these, these sisters in the entire village were about to get blown away by what Jesus can do. It wasn't a matter of what he didn't do. It's a matter of what he's about to do. The third part of this story speaks of the compassion the Bible says that Jesus was deeply moved by their grief. He, he saw Mary weeping. He saw those mourners with her weeping. All the, their friends, all the townspeople were, were weeping and mourning. And, and the Bible says that Jesus was, was deeply moved. And it's a word that's so strong in the Greek, it's hard to translate to the English. In, in the King James, it says he groaned he was so deeply moved. It was just a, a spontaneous surge of emotion. Some translations say he, he was angry and troubled in his emotion at this point. And, and, but the point is Jesus was feeling very deeply the distress that sin and death places upon this world. God is not uncaring. God is, is not removed from the burdens we bear, he, he feels them intensely. And he was, was deeply moved with a compa compassion and empathy. And then the Bible says in verse 35, Jesus wept. If you're ever in a Bible trivia question, you want to know the shortest verse in the entire Bible, John eleven thirty five 35 is the answer. The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. The shortest verse, and yet it communicates so much. Jesus wept with them. He grieved with them. He mourned with them. Jesus bore the burden that they were feeling. And he fulfilled that statement to, to mourn with those who mourn. Folks, it's okay to mourn. It's okay to grieve even when you know the rest of the story, it's okay to grieve. Sometimes well-meaning Christians will come to someone who has lost a loved one and, and, and they'll, they'll say things like, oh, oh, don't grieve, don't cry. Your loved one's in a better place. You'll see them again. This is only temporary. Don't grieve. Well, if you ever want to see permission to grieve, Jesus gives it to you right here because Jesus wept with them. And Jesus knew the rest of the story. Jesus knew the loss was only temporary. And in fact, it was a whole lot more temporary than they thought it was because in just a matter of minutes, Lazarus is going to come back to life. But Jesus still mourned with them. Folks, just because we have a hope of the resurrection doesn't mean we hurt when someone we care about dies. There, there's still a loss there. And everyone griefs in their own way. And it's okay to give people 
the room to, to grieve as they need to grieve. Even though we know the big picture. When my father passed away, it's been over 30 years ago now. He, he was younger than I am now, which is a sobering thought. But when my dad passed away, the, the, the end came more quickly than we all expected because we, we got word that things were good. The cancer had spread to his bones and we traveled to Colorado and within 24 hours he was gone. It, it just happened so quick. It was kind of a, a whirlwind. And, and, you know, we had arrangements to make and I felt like I... I didn't really grieve for my dad at the time because I, I had to be there for my mom. I had to be there for my brother and my sister. I, I spoke at my dad's funeral and, and God gave me the words to say, but I, I, I don't know that I really processed my grief at that time. And, and I, I was very close to my dad. Dad was, was one of my best friends in the whole world. And for me, it was, it was some years later that I opened a book and there was a piece of paper in that book and my dad had scratched some notes on it. And it was when I saw my dad's handwriting that it just triggered something in me. And I, I bawled like a baby. I, I, I cried like I hadn't cried for the past few years because that's what finally broke through. Folks, we, we all need to grieve as, as, as our emotions are set to grieve, even when we know the rest of the story. Jesus cared deeply. So much so that some of those in attendance said, look how, how much Jesus cared about his friend. And yet there were others who were questioning. There were others who, who said, well, look, this guy opened the eyes of the blind man. Couldn't he have done something to, to help this man to keep him from dying? And they were... They were saying, well, it, you know, the, the, the debate was going on. Is, is Jesus really God? And if he really is God, he, he could have done something. He didn't do something. So, so they were questioning, is he really God or is he not? Well, we have people in our day and age. They say, well, if God really is God, why does he do something about this suffering or this evil or this injustice. If, if, if God's really God, he, he ought to do something. If he doesn't do something, then God must not exist. That's the mindset of some people. And yet there's, do you hear in that statement a, a bit of arrogance? Let's paraphrase that to say, this is how I think things ought to be handled. And if God doesn't do things my way, then he's either not a very smart God or he's the God that doesn't even exist. Doesn't that sound a lot more arrogant when you put it that way? But isn't really that what people are saying? When they say well, when God doesn't do things like I think he ought to do them, then if he doesn't, then he doesn't exist. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. If we try to put God in our little box, that our minds can comprehend everything about him, then, then he is less than the almighty, all-knowing, all-gracious, all-good God. But I believe he is God. And I believe his thoughts are better than my thoughts. And his ways are better than my ways. And so it leads to the climax of the story. Here's his way. The command is how the story ends. The command in, in verse 38. Jesus got to the tomb and he said the word, take away the stone." Practical Martha says, uh, Jesus, wait a minute. Have, have you thought of this through here a little bit? He, he, he's been in the grave now for four days. And, and according to the Jewish custom, they would uh, anoint the bodies with spices, but they didn't truly embalm the body. And so those spices might have helped. But by four days, you know, there's going to be a little bit of a bad odor. There's going to be some decay. And, and the reality is death is gross. You've been driving down the highway and you, you see a, an animal that's been hit by the road and you know what happens, you know, they get rigor mortis and they, they start to stink and, and, and it, 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 death is gross. 
when someone dies and there's nobody with them, they're alone, what, 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 how does their body tend to get discovered? It's because the neighbor said, oh, there's a bad odor coming from that house or that, that apartment. And they check it out and sure enough, that person's already deceased. The reality is there's no other way to put it. Death is gross. God knows that. Jesus combated that. He knew that death is not only gross physically, it's gross spiritually. Death is not why God created us. God created us to have life and to have it more abundantly. His purpose is, is not just to go through the cycle of life to where we're, we're born, we live, we die, and that's all there is. No, he says there, there's something more to, to that than, than just gross death. So Jesus says, take away the stone. And after Martha objected, Jesus said in verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Martha could have said, no, Jesus, we're not going to open up that, that grave. It's going to be bad. It's going to be awful. It's going to be gross. We're not going to open up. That we're just not going to do it. You know, some people tell God no. They say, God, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm, I'm not going to believe on you. No, I, I'm not going to believe that you are a supernatural God. No, I, I'm not going to do it. And guess what? They miss out on the full nature of the goodness of our God. Martha, when she heard Jesus say this, she, she agreed. She said, oh, okay, let's do it. Let's take that stone away. She not only said with her words, yes, Lord, I believe that you are Christ. Now she acted on it. And she said, okay, Jesus, you say so, that's what we're going to do. And so the, the stone was taken away. But then we see a, a connection that Jesus deliberately made between he and the heavenly father. He said, Father, I thank you that you have always heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. There he is again. The big picture for Jesus is helping people to believe in him. And he's pointing out, look, there's, there's a connection. And in our minds, we still have a hard time grasping that Jesus was fully God, and yet he communicated with the Heavenly Father. The Heavenly Father fully God, and, and we don't understand the whole different persons of the Trinity aspect, and yet it's a reality that we just have to accept by faith. But, but go back to those verses that we read earlier that, that um, Mark led us in, in, in John chapter 5, starting a little bit earlier than where we started to read. Jesus gave them this answer, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Folks, that's an audacious statement that Jesus made. He's saying, the Father's the author of life. And he says, guess what? I'm also the author of life. The Pharisees were horrified. They thought, that's blasphemy. This guy says he's God. Never considering the possibility that this Jesus really is God. That he and the Father are one. They, they didn't get that. And as many times as Jesus said it in different ways, it, it's still a difficult concept to grasp. But you notice that 
Jesus was already thanking the Father for his answering to prayer even before Lazarus came out. And there's a reminder to us that we ought to start thanking the Father even before we gain the victory, even before things turn out the way we want it. Start thanking the Father now. Know that he always does hear, just as Jesus said, Father, I thank you that you always hear. Then comes the command in, excuse me, in verse uh, 43. Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Simple word of authority. It's, it's a command given. There's no magic wand, no abracadabra, no incantations. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing. It's, it's just a simple authoritative command. And I'm reminded of the story. You remember when, when the Aramean soldier Naaman, a man who is a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy, and he came to the prophet Elisha to be healed of his leprosy. And, and, and uh, Elisha said, come to the, have that man come to my house, and I'll heal him. And, and, and when he got to his door, Elisha just sent word out, say, go tell Naaman to go wash, dip himself seven times in the river Jordan, and he'll be healed. And, and, and Naaman was mad. He thought, I thought this guy would come out and, and wave his hands over me and call on the name of God and do some special incantation or something and heal me of my leprosy. He said, aren't, aren't the rivers back home just as good as better in the River Jordan? And, and yet the, his servant said, look, if he had said you to do some great big thing, wouldn't you have done it? Well, why not do this simple thing and just believe him? And Naaman finally obeyed what the prophet said and, and found the healing. A simple word was all that was needed. Not some big production, not some magic formula. The simple authoritative word of Jesus, Lazarus, come out. And he came out. You know, this is the greatest of this series that we've been doing of these resurrections. This is the most noteworthy one. Here, here's a guy... Uh, some of these others, they hadn't been dead and buried. He'd been buried for four days. All hope was gone. There, there was no life left in him. It was just a matter, not, certainly not a matter of waking up from a coma. And, and yet he's been gone four days. And yet all it takes is a word from Jesus and Lazarus comes back to life. You remember in the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, Martin Luther re referring to to Satan says, the, the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. A simple word shall fell him. A simple word of Jesus is all it takes. Praise the Lord. There's a certain victory in the word of Jesus. Even in the darkest of circumstances, even when all hope is gone, when Jesus says the word, there's victory. And victory, both present and future. One thing people may not realize about Lazarus is his resurrection caused a big stir. In fact, over in, in John ch chapter 12, Verse 9, the Bible says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out Jesus was there and, and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. <laughs> Lazarus just got brought back to life. And now he's being threatened with death again. And yet, you know what? I don't think Lazarus was worried about that at this point. If Jesus can bring him back to life once, he can do it again, can he? With each of these resurrections before Jesus, they're really resuscitations because they eventually did die another earthly death. And yet, they got the certainty that Jesus was in control. And so, I don't think Lazarus was afraid because 
of this word that was said in the end of the story in verse 44. When Jesus came out, he was still wrapped up with the linen cloths, the way they had him wrapped up, and, and the spices and the cloth around his head. And, and Jesus gave this word, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Take off what has bound him. Take off what restricts him. Take off what has, 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 has kept him tied up and, and, and contained and, and let him go. Set him free. And, and Lazarus was set free. Lazarus, I don't think, was worried about the, the Pharisees and the chief priests plotting against not only Jesus but him. He'd been set free from the, the, the fear of death. He'd been set free from the, the clothes of death. He'd been set free from any concern about death because he knew it was the simple word of Jesus that set him free. He had a foretaste of what eternal life was going to be like. And he'd say, what can man do to me? <laughs> Jesus is in control of my destiny. He got a foretaste of life. When I was Growing up, my, my mom didn't believe in letting us kids have dessert before dinner. But there was one concession she would make. Sometimes when mom made chocolate brownies, she'd whip up those brownies and put them in the oven. And, and then while they were baking, before we ate supper, mom would let my sister and I lick the spoon. And oh, that, that was a foretaste of what we knew was coming. You know, we, we could, we, we'd eat our vegetables because we knew those brownies were at the end of the meal, right? Lazarus got a foretaste of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He, he could endure whatever else might, might throw at him because he'd had a foretaste to let him know the good that was coming. Folks, that's the hope that we have. That's the certainty we have. You can be set free from the worries, the concerns, the the fears you might have because Jesus said I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me will live even if he dies so I'll ask you the question Jesus asked Martha do you Believe this. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are exactly who you say you are. And Lord, even though there's times we, we get confused, there's times we don't understand, Lord, we, we have the certainty of your faithfulness. We have the certainty of your trustworthiness that, that all it takes is a single command from you and the worries of this world, the fears of life and the fears of death are removed because you are the resurrection and the life. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be bound by those fears, you've set us free to let us go with a confidence, a certainty that our hope is in who you are. So we celebrate and rejoice in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our hymn of commitment and invitation is the song, I Am Resolved. No longer to linger, charmed by the, this world's delights. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him. Hasten so glad and free. Jesus is the greatest, the highest, and I will come to thee. Today, do you need to come to Jesus? Do you need to, to hasten to him? Not worrying about the world. Not worrying about the cares of this life, but saying, yes, I believe, Jesus, you are the Savior. I believe you are the Redeemer. And I want to trust you. He died on the cross to take away the penalty of sin. 
to give you the hope, the promise of eternal life when we receive that gift of him today. If you've heard that word, if you need to take a stand, if you need to make a commitment, maybe it's a first time commitment to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Perhaps it's a rededication, perhaps it's some step of obedience, whatever it might be. Let's stand together and say, I will hasten to Jesus because it's in him, I believe. Let's stand together. If you have a a commitment you want to make, a prayer request, I'll be here at the front to receive you as God leads you. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true. He is the saying to what he will if he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Just a moment, I'm going to ask uh, Alan Lewis if he'll close us in prayer. Just a, a couple of announcements before we go over. This, uh, again, this is a, a busy week. Uh, just a reminder that tomorrow night we are going to be uh, uh, displaying the uh, Sight and Sound presentation, Esther, that they do down at Branson. This is a recording of that, and, and we'll be showing that as a movie here in the sanctuary, 6.30 tomorrow night. Uh, bring, you know, there's no tickets, no cost or anything. It's free, so just invite others to come. That's 6.30 tomorrow night. On um, Wednesday, we are going to have an opportunity. We're going to have a couple opportunities in the next few weeks to meet John DeLuca, who is the church planter that we've kind of been working with. And if you'd like to meet John, uh, we're going to have uh, Java with John on, on Wednesday morning, 930. Uh, there'll be another chance in, in about 10 days after that. But you'd, you'd like to come and visit with him, ask whatever questions, get to know him a little bit, 930 on Wednesday morning. Uh, and there's going to be donuts and coffee there. All right. Yep. We had Java. We don't say don't. Oh, yeah. yeah. You couldn't think of a J that went with that. Anyway, um, Friday is Good Friday, and will be our, our, our Good Friday worship service at 7 o'clock, uh, a time simply to stop and to reflect and to consider just what the cross means for us. And it's, you know, sometimes we go in such a hurry to get to Easter, we don't take time to realize the sacrifice Christ made. So it's always a very special service. So that's on Friday at 7 o'clock. On Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock, we're going to be having our Easter egg hunt. Uh, we're going to have several activities. John DeLuca and the families with his church plant are going to be working with us. We do need some volunteers. We need some guy or road folks to be here. We're going to have different activities. We're going to have a mini petting zoo and things like that to to help families and kids stick around. So we, we want you not only to help as a volunteer, but also just to start conversations with our neighbors and get to visit, get to know people. And, and we're giving people this, an option to say, hey, if you want an established church, here's Guy Road. If you want a brand new church plant that's going to be started in the fall, uh, here's the, the Well Community Church that John DeLuca will be planning, but we're going to be working in partnership. That's two o'clock Saturday afternoon. So we could use some help with that. Then of course, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. So that time of Celebrating, we've been doing this series on, on resurrections. The greatest resurrection of all is the resurrection of Jesus who we'll be celebrating next week. So, so those are our announcements for the week. It's a, it's a busy week, but it's a great week to celebrate who God is. So let me ask Alan Lutus if he'll dismiss us in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to come out and worship you, our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer, and we just thank you that you are all-powerful, all-knowing, and you love us. You gave your life for our sins. 
that we might have everlasting life through your resurrection. And we just thank you for that. We thank you for each and every one that has come out today to hear your word. And we ask that you'll guide and direct us throughout this coming week as we celebrate this wonderful time of year, Easter. These things we'd ask in your gracious and holy name. Amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you next Sunday.